broadcast of the North Idaho College Public Forum, a student production. Your moderator is North Idaho College political scientist, Tony Stewart. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is once again my great pleasure to welcome you to another program of the North Idaho College Public Forum. In fact, this is the 164th program over the past four years. On behalf of the panel, I would like to welcome to our program this evening Dr. Rolando Bonacchia, who is a most prominent academic person and writer within the field of history. Dr. Bonacchia is serving on the faculty at Boise State University. As to past academic background, he completed his graduate work at George Washington and Georgetown universities in this country. In addition to that, he is a writer and is the co-editor of Cuba in Revolution, published in 1971 by Doubleday and several other publications. At the present time, he is contributing editor to the Handbook of Latin American Studies and a member of the editorial board of the University of Pittsburgh's forthcoming Journal of Cuban Studies. He has been on our campus today to speak to our students on the subject of internal politics in Cuba and relations between Cuba and the United States. He has consented to be on our program this evening to discuss Latin American politics with a special emphasis on Cuba. Dr. Bonacci, it's a pleasure having you on our program. It's a great pleasure. Thank you very much. I also welcome back this evening three of our regular panel members to my Far left is Professor Richard Heinemann, who serves in the Division of Communication Arts at North Idaho College, is also director and coach of our debate program, and is finishing his doctorate at Washington State University. Welcome back. Thank you, Tony. I also welcome back Mary Lou Reed, who uh, is a regular member of this panel and is most active in political and environmental circles throughout the Northwest and did graduate study at Columbia University in theology. Welcome back, Mary Lou. Thank you, Tony. And finally, Dr. Ken Wright, who is to my immediate left. Uh, Dr. Wright is chairman of the Division of Physical Sciences at North Idaho College and also teaches in the field of chemistry, receiving his doctorate from the University of Idaho. Welcome back. Thanks, Tony. We'll proceed to questions at once, and the first question this evening from Professor Heinemann. Uh, doctor, in your opinion, is it now just uh, wishful thinking think that the Cuban people will uh, rise up and overthrow the Castro regime? <clears throat> I believe, I believe so, but let me point out that perhaps one of the great mistakes that were made by the American government and the American people was to assume that the Cuban people was at any given point going to revolt against the Cuban government. I think that perhaps the to the emotion, uh, emotional atmosphere of 1959 and 1960, the American government made the assumption that the Cubans did not support the Cuban government and Fidel Castro in particular. Perhaps one of the indications that we received that in fact they did support them was the Bay of Pigs invasion that met with complete failure in 1961. I think that the people continues to support the Cuban government today as much as they did in 1961. Well, what does the uh, Castro regime have to offer the Cuban people that the Batista regime did not? Um, I think, you know... Uh, generally speaking. Uh, generally speaking, uh, I think that we have to face the fact that prior to the Cuban Revolution, Cuban wealth was concentrated in the hands of a very small minority of wealthy Cubans and foreign investors. I hear very frequently uh, uh, people say, well, but the Cuban society at this point does not have uh, as many consumer goods as they did in 1958. And that is true, but one needs to uh, keep in mind that consumer goods in 1958 were enjoyed by a very small percentage of the population. Today, the large mass of the Cuban people have access to the basic goods for survival, and they 
as a whole did not even have that much in 1958. Now, you just answered my, uh, what was going to be my third question, do they have uh, the basic staples? Mm -hmm. And you said yes. Right. Fine. Thank you. Mary Lou Reed. Uh, Dr. Bonchia, in your uh, lecture to the students, you gave a list of positive results of the Cuban uh, Revolution and some of the negative uh, aspects. Would you mind repeating those now? Because I thought they were very helpful. Uh, I believe, you know, that 15 years after the revolution began in Cuba, there have been positive and negative developments. Among the positive developments have been the tremendous effort made by the Cuban government to deliver an education to every single citizen within Cuba. I think that 15 years after the Cuban government can claim a monumental success on the educational field, illiteracy, for example, amounted to about one million in 1959. There was people who did not know how to read and write. Cuba is the first country in Latin America who can claim to have eradicated completely the illiteracy problem. And with uh, this assessment, uh, many international organizations coincide that in effect it has been achieved. Uh, the healthcare program, I think, is another example of a positive achievement. I realize that in this society, Socialized medicine has a negative connotation, but I believe that in the case of Cuba, socialized medicine has rendered uh, tremendous benefits to the mass of the people. Cuban physicians had, in my opinion, in 1959, the attitude that American physicians have today in this society, and that is that health, medical services, is a commodity to be sold and not an inherent right on every citizen. As of 1960, socialized medicine was implanted, implemented in Cuba, and that has meant that every single citizen has had access to the best medical care regardless of his income. Um, some of the diseases, for example, that were predominant in Cuba in 1959, like intestinal parasitism, tuberculosis, gastroenteritis, all of these diseases have now been completely eliminated. Now, you also ask about some of the negative developments, and I think that the most important uh, negative development in the last 15 years have been that the leadership of the Cuban Revolution have been unwilling to allow large segments of the Cuban population to chair in the decision-making process of the government. And I think that that is the greatest weakness of the revolution as of this moment. Can I just open up one facet of, of these aspects? and ask how can you possibly say that illiteracy has been completely eradicated? How did they do that? We have not, we have not been able to do that in the United States. I think the answer to that lays on the tremendous amount of effort and monetary resources which the Cuban government have devoted to the field of education. Cuban educational budget has augmented by about 22 times since 1958. It amounts to about 30% of the national budget of the country at the present time. This does not include approximately 35,000 students who are attending uh, uh, Russian universities at the present time. Well, for example, one of the things that they have been uh, complimented have been the fact that once they began to eradicate illiteracy, that reading and teach and, and reading and writing was being taught, the government also developed all type of follow-up programs to assure that the people will not learn those newly acquired 
uh, knowledge. Because as you know, many times it happens that a man is taught how to read and write, and if you do not have a follow-up program, eventually he will forget what he has learned. So uh, they're, they're attacking this on the level of the primary, uh, the, the student who goes at the age of five or six, and also on the adult level? Also at the adult level. Thank you. Dr. Wright. Dr. Bonacia, I'd like to get into the field of U.S.-Cuba relations a little bit and ask a question involving the CIA. Our CIA has certainly fallen into a bit of disrepute lately. Only yesterday on the news there was an announcement made that our CIA has probably uh, held on to some biological warfare weapons in direct opposition to the President's order of a couple of years ago. And certainly the CIA has been implicated in the Bay of Pigs fiasco and a lot of other things involving Cuba. I'm wondering if, in your opinion, has the CIA been a totally negative influence on U.S.-Cuba relations, or has the CIA done anything right in, with respect to U.S.-Cuba relations? Well, you know, let me, you know, in, in my opinion, uh, the, the CIA, not that I sympathize with some of the objectives of the CIA, but on the other hand, I believe that the CIA has been uh, traditionally an scapegoat for many of the blunders committed by American presence, perhaps due to the nature of intelligence activities uh, CIA cannot say when they have indeed obtained a feat, while on the other hand everyone finds out when they blunder. Um, I, you know, I feel that in terms of CIA operations, you know, in present day world politics, the United States, just like any other nation, needs uh, an institution that is committed to intelligence gathering to the collection of information that will allow the leadership of this country to make uh, sound decisions, or at least decisions based on as many facts as possible. On the other hand, uh, something else is when the CIA begins to make decisions as to which leader abroad ought to die and which one ought to leave. And it seems like uh, for what we're beginning to hear, that the CIA, as early as 1960, was already making some recommendations to the effect that Fidel Castro should be assassinated uh, as a way of undermining the Cuban revolutionary process. In the particular case of Cuba, there is no doubt that the intelligence that was gathered prior to the Bay of Pigs invasion was completely unfounded. And it seems like if the professional CIA officers became involved in the emotionalism of the Cuban exiles who were completely convinced that the people did not support the revolution. And indeed, I think that on that, they were completely mistaken as history showed in 1961. Professor Heinemann. A doctor. Uh, is it or is it not a fact that uh, Castro is a dedicated Marxist during the time that he's leading the revolution? Or well, in the historical research that I have done on the political evolution of Castro since 1946, I find nothing that will indicate that Castro at any point had any relationship or any commitment to Marxism or Marxism-Leninism. I think that Castro, if you look at Cuban nationalism and Cuban history, you will see that Castro has been one of many Cuban revolutionaries who since 1898 were pursuing social justice, national sovereignty, which meant an end to the interference of the United States in Cuba but not necessarily uh, sympathizers of communism or Marxist uh, ideology. As I look back into that period of the radicalization of the revolution and the rupture of relations between the United States and Cuba, I 
have come more and more to think that Castro declared himself a Marxist Leninist out of practical convenience rather than ideological commitment. Maybe we should remember that during the year 1959, Castro described his revolution as democratic. During the year 1960, he described it as humanist, mixture of existential philosophy with democracy. I don't think that he quite knew what he really wanted. But by 1960, as the United States and Cuba moved into confrontation, Castro began to realize that he needed to sway the revolution to the left and drift to the socialist camp as the only hope to make the revolution survive. So he declared the revolution socialist a day before the Bay of Pigs invasion. That day, he also said that now that he had declared the revolution socialist, the Soviet Union had the moral obligation to help the revolution survive. Of course, he knew that the, Soviet, that the United States was about to launch the invasion. The only problem with Castro's socialist revolution in 1961 was that at that time, there were no Cuban communists as members of the Cuban government. And that presented, from a theoretical viewpoint, problems to the Soviet Union. Was Cuba the very first socialist revolution to be undertaken by other people other than communists? I think that his decision was mainly practical and not out of ideology. So we could uh, say now that Basically, Castro is a nationalist, and then a, a Marxist, Leninist second, and that would be because he's a pragmatist. I believe so. But now, what about his uh, brother, uh, Che? You mean brother Raul? Raul, yeah. That's right. Raul is at the present time uh, the commander-in-chief of the Cuban Armed Forces and the second secretary general of the Cuban Communist Party. That means that in the event that anything was to happen to Fidel Castro, Raul would immediately be in the line of succession as Secretary General of the Cuban Communist Party. Uh, would he be of the, uh, the same political stripe or thinking as, as uh, Castro? He would a, be. A nationalist first? And, he, uh, he would be, I believe, with only one difference. Castro has what his brother Raul does not, and that is charisma. So as a consequence, during these 15 years, there have been hardliners and softliners within the Cuban government. The times that Castro has prevailed over these hardliners have been usually because of his own charismatic appeal for the, within the leadership and within the people. But what something happened to Castro, and if his brother Raul was to take over, then the hardliners in economic policy, in foreign policy, would take over uh, the government. I have a question I'd like to interject that relates to what uh, Professor Heim has been talking about. Uh, in recent readings that I have done, I have noticed that certainly the USSR has poured in billions of dollars into Cuba's economy and governmental process over the past 15 years. And some of the articles I've read also indicate because of this tremendous economic support that the Soviet Union has dictated many of the economic and political policies of Cuba or, ha or has had at least tremendous influence over those. Would you comment on that? Yes. Well, as you pointed out, uh, the Soviet Union has been the key factor that has kept the Cuban economy alive during the last 15 years. Between 1961 to 1970, the Soviet Union delivered $1 million a day in economic assistance, and as of 1970, they have been delivering $2 million a day in economic uh, assistance. Now, this imposes uh, burdens on the Cuban government in the sense that they have had to 
compromise the independence that Castro in 1959 had promised the Cuban people. So in essence what happened as of 1959 was that if as of 1959, Cuba was under the influence of the United States. After 1961, they had fallen under the political influence of the Soviet Union. Castro, however, has tried several times in the last 15 years to regain some of his independence. So, for example, during the 1960s, he unleashed guerrilla wars in Latin America. That was his position, and a position that was not supported by the Soviet Union at that time. As a matter of fact, even though some people might find it hard to believe, it seems like if the Soviet Union was cooperating with the Central Intelligence Agency to undermine Che Guevara's guerrillas in South America, the Soviet Union did not support them at any time. Yet, Eventually, Castro was also forced to comply and drop his adventures in Latin America. Now, another example of the type of influence and pressure that the Soviet Union can exercise is related to Castro's position in non-intervention. Ever since 1959, we have heard Castro repeatedly speak about the principle of non-intervention, that a superpower ought not to interfere in the internal affairs of a small nation. Yet, when the Soviet Union invaded Czechoslovakia in 1968, Castro was pressured, and he had to come to the defense of the Soviet Union, who had just invaded a small power. So this is, I think, examples that even though he would like to maintain his independence in crucial issues to the Soviet Union, he has had to give in and follow the dictates of Moscow. Thank you. May Lou Reed. Well, on the surface, it appears that Chinese communism and Cuban communism have a great number of things in common. And I think I'd like to ask, uh, what is the status? of Cuban-Chinese relations, and does, it, does Cuba sometimes play uh, the two Russian powers, I mean, the two communist powers off against each other, Russia and China? Well, very good question. You know, uh, between 1960 till 65, observers of the Cuban government, ideological position in the Sino-Soviet conflict had said that the Cuban government had their heart in Peking, but they had their stomach in Moscow, which meant that ideologically they might have sympathized with the Chinese concept of a struggle of national liberation, but on the other hand, it was the Soviet Union the one delivering the economic assistance. This tension concerning the Sino-Soviet conflict culminated in 1964. In 1964, Che Guevara, the Cuban Minister of Industries, traveled to China, and in China he delivered a series of speeches in which he stated that the Cuban government must come all out and express that the position was to support the Chinese government in the Sino-Soviet dispute. Now, when Guevara returned to Cuba, he found out that he was already, that the machinery had been set in motion to dismiss him as, prime min as Minister of Industries. But interestingly, Fidel Castro, while beginning to undermine the position of Che within Cuba, on the other hand, began to purify Chinese influences within the Cuban army. So all of those that were supporters of national liberation wars were immediately expelled from the Cuban armed forces.
By 1964, the Chinese refused to sell rice to Cuba. And in 1964, this is something that it has now been forgotten, but in 1964, Castro accused Mao of being a senile old man who did not understand Marxism-Leninism. Now, as of 1964, China and Cuba have reconciled their differences, and the Cubans, of course, have at the present time good relationships with China. Dr. Wright. Here's a strictly opinion question, which you may be able to answer in one word. Do you consider Fidel Castro to be a political genius? I think that Castro will go down into history as one of the great political geniuses of the 20th century. And of course, being uh, uh, a Cuban in exile, as I am, it has been a long road for me to reach such a conclusion. But after 10 years of studying the man very closely, I have concluded, in my opinion, that he's one of the greatest tactical politicians in the Western Hemisphere. Okay, can I change the subject now? <laughs> You've already told us about the success of Cuba, the Cuban Revolution in regards to the health care of the populace. And it's generally acknowledged that we certainly have a population problem in the whole world, and Latin America seems to have one of the biggest ones. I'm wondering if Cuba has done a good job of, of population planning, and how do they stack up, in your opinion, with the rest of Latin America? Yes, um, the Cubans have encouraged, let me point out to you that in 1959, the population in Cuba was six million. As of 1974, it has been nine million. It has been there and increased. But the Cuban government has encouraged a program of uh, birth control policies. That is to say, not that it is demanded, but that it is available, and the Cuban people is encouraged to take advantage of the uh, family planning programs. Uh, Castro feels that Anywhere between 9 to 10 million, Cuba will have the labor manpower that will be needed for years to come to keep the Cuban economy functioning efficiently, while on the other hand controlling the population problem. Now this has been possible in Cuba in large measure because the influence of the Catholic Church was undermined largely during these last 15 years. So, for example, the church at this particular point will not be allowed to take an open stand as to whether they support or they don't support birth control programs. But as you know, in the rest of Latin America, one of the factors, you know, among others, but one of the factors that has contributed to the failure of birth control programs have been that the Catholic Church has taken an outright opposition position on this issue, and of course they exercise great influence among the Catholic populations of those countries. Professor Heinemann. Well, you said that the Catholic Church really uh, does not have much influence in Cuba right now? Yes. Uh, have they, well, I don't know, I'll have to ask you. Prior to um, Castro's regime, did the Catholic Church have schools going? That's right. Do they now? Uh, no, they don't. When did Castro um, close down the Catholic schools? You see, most of the, all of the Catholic schools in Cuba were private schools. In 1961, the Cuban government nationalized all private schools, whether they were religiously affiliated or just, uh, you know, of a, non, of a lay philosophy. So as of 1961, all private education ceased to exist. These were the years of an outright confrontation between the Catholic Church and the Cuban state. And as you may remember, it reached very severe proportions. In 1962, the Cuban government deported about 80% of the Catholic priests and nuns from the island. 1968, relationships have begun to 
be accommodated. And the Cuban government now has ceased harassment of those citizens that would like to attend religious services on Sundays. But the activity of the church is confined to Sundays as far as mass or religious services. Do you have, does Cuba have a cardinal in residence there? They, we used to have, but the Cuban cardinal in residence died in about 1960. What the Cuban Republic now has is a papal nuncio, or a representative of the Roman Catholic Pope in Havana, which is, by the way, a very progressive individual who have accomplished a lot in terms of ameliorating the tensions between the church and the state. Um, all right, another approach here. How long do you believe it will be before the United States resumes full diplomatic relations with Cuba? I think there is a very good possibility that after the next presidential election, we will see the American president moving toward negotiation, direct negotiations. Uh, I feel that already both Cuba and the United States government have given many signals that that's where they are going to or leading to. But I think that President Ford right now may not wish to establish direct negotiations that could alienate some of the more conservative senators before the presidential election. Now, it might be that after the next election, we will see then something set up to deal with the problems involved in recognition. Fine, thank you. Uh, Dr. Bonacci, I have a global ideological question that certainly relates to uh, Cuba and the rest of the world. It seems to me that the foreign policy of the United States recently has been one of detente with obviously the Soviet Union and, and with China now moving in that direction toward Cuba in relation to your last question, uh, answer. But in relation to this, I was wondering such conferences as the European Security Conference or the Helsinki Conference in which we uh, through Dr. Kissinger, agreed to recognize the East European countries' boundaries and, and, and pretty much concede that those are under the influence of the Soviet Union. Uh, and we may be going to do that in relation to Cuba and others. One criticism of that approach is that what we're saying to the communist world, we recognize all those countries in which you have influence or control, but as far as countries where we have a sphere of influence, those are negotiable or they could be lost in the future, such as Laos and Cambodia and South Vietnam recently and, and the problems in Portugal. Is there a danger for the United States in pursuing this kind of policy? Well, I, I believe, uh, as I was pointing out during the lecture, that one of the great difficulties of this country have been the belief that the United States of America sh should or ought to be the policeman of the world that they should be involved in every single conflict that develop abroad, that they should have a say on anything that may happen uh, abroad. I feel that as the experience of Vietnam show, such a particular policy could lead this country into a very catastrophic situation. So indeed, you know, I believe that the United States should move toward recognizing uh, those countries with whom we might not sympathize ideologically, but yet the people might have chosen that particular political system. Isn't there also a problem here? I'm playing the devil's advocate at the sure. moment. But isn't there also a problem that we had one extreme of trying to place the world, and we obviously had problems with that as in Vietnam, but isn't there a danger of taking the other extreme where we withdraw, uh, or we become so sensitive to this question of policing that if one country after another one does fall uh, under some communist system, and we do know from the examples we have before us, Cuba being one, that once a society does fall under communist influence, there are not free elections in which two years later or ten years later they can choose another path, that so much of the world might come under the influence of communism, it would be no longer a balance of power in the world, and we'd find ourselves with the major resources of the world cut off and therefore isolated, and therefore even in danger of the system we have. I think, I think that's a very, you know, it's a possibility and certainly a very dangerous possibility. But I think that one of the tragic developments, as I see it, uh, 
in American society in terms of global foreign policy is that somehow it seems that as of the 1950s, this country has tried to rely more and more in military force in order to influence other nations. Uh, I think that there might have been a time when this country could exercise influence, real influence, through moral leadership. It somehow seems that we have steadily moved to influence other nations either in terms of the money that we give them to see if we can buy them off, or in the last uh, resort, uh, the utilization of military force. I think that in both instances, that is not the way to influence or create lasting, lasting uh, friends in the community of nations. But I think that what we have to keep in mind is that when there is a revolution abroad, when there is a possibility of a communist takeover abroad, it is not simply because the Communist Party uh, mobilizes its men, who usually are a very small minority in, in underdeveloped countries, but the causes of revolution lie on the poverty that is prevalent in those nations, the oppression that the people suffer, the lack of education, the lack of health facilities. And of course, the great dilemma is that this country, the United States, more frequently than not, support those governments who calling themselves anti-communists are as oppressive to, this, to their people as communist regimes could ever be. So when the revolution explodes, if it ever happens, one of the consequences usually is that the people try to vent their anger upon the United States government that had been the one to support oppressive and dictatorial regimes in their country for many years. One final question, then back to the panel. Based upon that, if we do uh, try to lessen our influence, and are, there are free elections in other countries, I'm speaking of Italy and France in the future, along with Portugal and others, if from time to time, the decision of the electorate temporarily is one to experiment with communism, but through the process, they lose their freedoms in that modern technology is brought from the Soviet Union and other countries to keep and maintain total control once it is there. How do we, as supporters of a different ideology, a representative democracy, ever back the wall up? That is, how do we ever turn around a system that has taken such control in countries where there's no longer an option for the citizenry. Well, <clears throat> you know, let me say, in Professor Stewart, that if I had the answer really to that question, I might not be, after all, a professor, and I would be in, perhaps in the White House giving solution to that problem. No doubt that it is a great dilemma. But I believe that on the final analysis, once a political event has taken place in a nation abroad, it is going to be up to the people of those countries, for that particular country. But this is the point. If it is a country where the people have no say, but only the small echelon or, or the Politburo of the party, then how does one resolve that problem? I still feel, you know, maybe I'm thinking of Thomas Paine, who said, give me liberty or give me death. And I will narrow it down all the way to the point that if a government has been imposed, then you might create the conditions for a revolution within the people that might topple that regime. But what I'm saying is that the United States government cannot create the conditions that will propel another nation to accomplish another objective. You know, and I think that we have a case on Vietnam. We could pour into Vietnam billions of dollars. We could pour all the blood that we want to pour. But if the people does not have the determination, there is nothing that we can do. And that is the point. There are also other examples, though, aren't they, such as Hungary and Czechoslovakia, where the conditions apparently were ripe for revolution, and the revolution did take place, but a greater power in, in, with modern technology, the Soviet Union came in and simply could destroy that will. True, but I, you know, I think that this is, of course, related to you know, superpower politics, give and take, 
when the United States landed in the Dominican Republic in 1965, the Soviet Union recognized the fear of influence of the United States. I do not know, maybe I am optimistic, but I feel that perhaps with the passing of time, the will of the people might be coerced temporarily, but not forever. Lou Reed. Professor Heinemann brought up the possibility of renewed Cuban-U.S. relationships and our relations. And I think we should perhaps discuss this in the light of Cuba's economy. Do you feel that they now feel that the U.S. market is essential for the economy of Cuba and that this is a, will be a great motivating track factor towards reaching a, a, a reconciliation? Yes. Well, Cuba could survive economically without economic relations with the United States. But on the other hand, the Cubans are aware that if they succeed in re-establishing economic relations, things are going to be a little bit easier for Cubans themselves. So for example, the Cuban government is very much interested in obtaining spare parts for industrial machinery in Cuba. Even up to the present time, all of the machinery of the sugar mills of the electrical and telephone companies is machinery that had been made in the United States government. The deterioration of the machinery had had an impact on the Cuban economy. Some of that machinery, spare parts, had been replaced, others have not. So I would say that the Cuban government, for example, would be interested in acquiring those products. They will also be interested in acquiring some medicines which are not available in Cuba, or which are extremely expensive if you purchase it through the Soviet Union. But whatever happens, I believe that it's going to be, at least at first, on a cash basis. If the Cuban government has the capital to purchase, then the United States will sell. It might be that with the passing of time, the United States government will agree to lend credit to the Cuban government. Well, what do you think is in it for the U.S.? Do you suspect that there are, are pressures uh, upon the administration from some of the businesses who would like to seek uh, reparations from, from the industries that were uh, expropriated? Uh, you suggested that you didn't think this would, subject would come up till after the election. Uh, my question is, uh, do you think there's a business influence for, and also do you feel that the Cuban exiles in Florida are a very strong political force working against reconciliation? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, first, you know, concerning American businessmen, um, to, in, there is no doubt, in my opinion, that American businessmen are interest, interested in exploiting the Cuban market particularly if Castro has the capital to pay in cash. Well, certainly I think that they have, that the American businessmen have the same attitude toward Cuba than they have shown toward China or the Soviet Union. If you have the cash and we get the product, we will sell it with, regardless of ideological considerations. Now, uh, in that sense, they are a force for reestablishing relations. As far as compensation of what they lost in Cuba, they might or might not press for that. The reason being the following. American businessmen lost in Cuba about $1.8 billion. But the United States government, as of 1960, allowed the multinational corporations to write off in tax deductions everything that they had lost in Cuba. So for example, there are some Cuban, uh, some economists, observers, who have said that already the multinational corporations have obtained the capital that they lost in Cuba through tax deductions ever since 1960. So then the question is whether the United States government will try to collect from the Cuban government. But so far, 
the United States government have not really come forth and said that this is going to be one of the issues, uh, preconditions for recognition of Cuba. I think that it will come up in the negotiations. So you, you feel the compensation then would be due directly to the United States government rather That's than right. to the business? Well, That's could you could you say something about the political force clout of Cuban exiles? We were, became aware of this during the Watergate trials, that there really was fantastic, rather right-wing conservative group that had uh, the Cuban community in Florida had become. And uh, since I suspect you are, have been at some time a part of, of this community, perhaps you could say something about that. I must say that being a Cuban, I have been part of a community, but politically and ideologically, I have found myself through the years having very little in common with the Cuban exile. The exile is very emotional, very narrow-minded, particularly when he comes to view problems related to Cuba. So if you were to speak to a Cuban exile, he would tell you that 15 years after, the revolution has not accomplished anything that is positive. He will not give you the slightest credit to some of the social undertakings of Cuba. Of course, being extremely right-wing, the Cubans have been opposed to a policy of detent detente between the United States and the Soviet Union. They have opposed the reestablishment of relations between China and the United States. So needless to say that they are completely opposed to the reestablishment of relations between Cuba and America. Um, I think that when negotiations begin to take place, chances are that we're going to see a lot of right-wing demonstrations in the Florida area on the part of Cuban exiles who are opposed to an accommodation between the two countries. Dr. Wright, Mary Lou Reed's prior question raised a new one in my mind that I'd like to, to get a, maybe a quick answer from you on. What do you think the chances are that the United States government will be able to collect a dime from Cuba for reparations on well, nationalized industry. This is the um, postural, you know, again, is a very pragmatic and practical politician. He realizes that if he succeeds in establishing economic relations, he might be able to regain some of his independence from the Soviet Union. He might begin to move into a middle position rather than to be totally dependent on the Soviet Union for assistance. On the other hand, he sees the reestablishment of relations as a moral victory, a symbolic victory. That is, either recognition for the Cuban Revolution, it will mean that the United States has come full circle that they had failed in overthrowing the revolution and that now they recognize that the revolution is there to stay. Those two things, I think, are important for Castro. And for that reason, I think that he might be willing to entertain the possibility of paying some compensation for those properties if that might be one of the issues that the United States bring as precondition for recognition. I do not think that he will pay the full amount because if you charge interest to the $1.8 billion, then the compensation will have to amount to $3.8 billion. I don't think that Cuba will be willing to pay that much. But somewhere in between, Castro might reach a compromise and, and pay. So the cost might be well worth what he stands to gain. I think so. The next question I have to ask may be more obvious, and the answer may be more obvious than I think it is, but I'm wondering if you think that Fidel Castro was acting out of strict necessity, that is, as a pawn of the Soviet Union, when he allowed Soviet missiles to be put into Cuba or whether he did that as a carefully planned political strategy? Well, I give you my, my own opinion, which certainly 
is not shared by many scholars of the Cuban Revolution. As you know, the consensus is that the Soviet Union utilized Cuba as a pawn, uh, that they had attempted to dislocate the balance of military power between the Soviet Union and the United States. I feel that Castro, you know, number one, was in accord with placing the missiles. But I believe that he had anticipated that at some point the Soviet Union will have to withdraw the missiles from Cuba. I find it even hard to believe today that the Soviet Union could have been so naive as to think that the United States government would allow missiles being placed 90 miles from its shores. My opinion is that after the Bay of Pigs invasion, the Soviet Union and the Cuban government realized that the United States had not given up their intentions of overthrowing the Cuban Revolution, the first socialist revolution in the Western Hemisphere. And you may remember that when the late President Kennedy spoke to the Bay of Pigs invaders in December 1961, he told them, I assure you that this flag, the flag of the Bay of Pigs invasion, said that this flag will be returned to you soon in a free Havana. So up to that point, Kennedy had not given up plans to invade Cuba for a second time. Throughout the year 1962, Central Intelligence Agency financial assistance to Cuban exile groups increased. And throughout 1962, we saw Cuban exile raids against Cuba, one after the other, after the other. 1962, the Cubans began to enter the United States Army. They were all placed at Fort Jackson. The idea being that these men who are now going in will eventually be sent into Cuba. All of a sudden, when the Cuban exiles were believing that it was a matter of months again before another invasion was unleashed, the news broke that missiles had been placed in Cuba. The negotiations that ensued gave at least one positive result for Cuba, or the revolution. Namely, that President Kennedy assured the Soviet Union that at no time in the future he would invade the Cuban Republic. Moreover, after 1962, the CIA began to cut financial assistance to anti-Castro groups. So as of 1962, anti-Castro groups were completely undermined financially. Professor Heinemann. Uh, doctor, now we've talked about the, uh, the cash advantages of uh, resuming uh, diplomatic relations with Cuba. Uh, outside of a few uh, American corporations getting some cash for selling their parts to get Castro going on it, uh, what advantages would it be for the United States? What could they give us? It seems like what we're talking about, we're giving everything to Cuba and we were getting into a unilateral situation. We don't need their sugar anymore, for example, do we? Well, we have another market. I mean, what can they do for us? That's right. Well, I think that what the United States stand to gain for me is assurances that the Cuban government will in no way export revolution into Latin America. And face it, the United States has had to spend millions of dollars in military assistance to Latin American government simply because of the Castroid threat in Latin America. So needless to say, I think that one possible advantage for the United States would be assurances that uh, efforts at exporting revolution will not be attempted in the future. Wouldn't that be a form of black, isn't that a form of blackmail? Well, you can view it as blackmail, or in terms also of, you know, the, the preconditions that each country have set as 
preconditions that must be met if recognition is to be uh, realized. Pardon me, what was the other? I cut you off there, I'm sorry, Dr. The, I was saying about the military assistance, okay, one possible gain is assurances a revolution will not be exported. A second would be assurances that Cuba will not continue hostile propaganda in Latin America against the United States uh, government. I think that both of these are very important to the United States. Uh, let me ask you, do you consider uh, Fidel Castro a benevolent dictator? I mean, the only objection I've heard that you have to ca cast the Castro regime is that there does not seem to be a, the people do not have a, um, a piece in the decision making. Now, is that really that a big a deal for the Cuban people that they have a voice in government? I mean, aren't they, are they happy under a dictator? Sure. Well, you know, I, I would say that in, from a historical viewpoint, the Cuban people have never had very much to say in the decision-making process of Cuba mm -hmm. at any time. Uh, the history of Cuba has been the history of right-wing dictatorships, which, as Castro, did not allow much participation. But on the other hand, I do feel philosophically that the complete liberation of, of man must come not only when he has bread to eat, but also when he has the liberty to decide uh, his own destiny. And this is why I think that it's important that those of us who recognize some of the positive contributions of the revolution should also point out the negative development in the hope that at some point they might be corrected. With that, I'm going to bring our program to conclusion. Unfortunately, we're out of time, and I can see from the panel's notebooks they have many other <laughs> questions they would like to ask. But Dr. Bonachia, it's been a pleasure having you on our program, and thank you for taking this time. Thank you very much. I also thank Richard Heinemann, Mary Lou Reed, and Ken Wright for, again, many outstanding questions on many aspects of Cuba and its relation to the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, I do hope that you have enjoyed our program this evening and that we have asked some of those questions that you might ask if you had been on the program. May I take this opportunity to invite you to be with us again next week at the same time at 6 o'clock, when again on Channel 7 we'll be interviewing another personality from somewhere in the Northwest or the United States. Good evening. The North Idaho College Public Forum can be seen at this same time each week over this station. The preceding student production was brought to you by videotape recordings.